Satanology. We'll look at the reality, names, identity, and nature, personality, depravity, and activity of Satan. The reality of Satan. In the Old Testament, the book of Genesis depends upon the reality of Satan working through or in the form of a serpent to cause the fall of mankind. If there is no real entity such as that depicted in the Bible concerning Satan, then there is no explanation for the fall of mankind. Likewise, in the book of Job, which was written around the same time as Genesis and perhaps even before Genesis, the story depends on the reality of Satan to make any sense. If God truly exists and Job truly exists, then Satan truly exists. The king of Babylon in Isaiah 14 and the king of Tyre in Ezekiel 28 some say that these cannot be explained without having a supernormal being such as Satan behind them. And in Zechariah 3, Satan is a definite person who opposes the angel of Jehovah, which as we've seen is the pre-incarnate Son of God. In the New Testament, every writer recognizes his reality. 19 of the 27 books of the New Testament mention Satan by name. And the eight books that do not specifically mention him by name imply his existence by mentioning evil angels or demons. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness and is tempted by the devil. And Satan, in the New Testament, similar to the book of Job, requests of God permission to sift Peter, Simon, like wheat. In Revelation 12, 9, the great dragon is identified as the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, identifying the real entity behind the symbol and creature. In Revelation 20, the dragon again is identified as the serpent of old from Genesis, who is the devil and Satan, and he is bound for a thousand years during the millennial kingdom. A biblical argument for Satan and demons can be made. What Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, teaches is true. Jesus Christ teaches the existence of Satan and demons. In Matthew 4, 3, when Jesus is tempted, he speaks to Satan. He says, Go, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus continues to carry on a conversation with Satan. In Luke 8, 29, Jesus speaks to demon, casting them out, asking them what their name is. And in Matthew 12, 23, 25, in response to the charge that he does miracles by Beelzebub, a name for Satan, he teaches concerning Satan's kingdom that it cannot stand if it is divided against itself. So we conclude from the teaching of Jesus that therefore the existence of Satan and demons is true. The names of Satan, identity and nature and personality of Satan. There are many names that are used for Satan. We'll look at just a few here. Anointed cherub, some see this and conclude that he was the highest rank of the highest class of angelic beings. He's a prince of this world, shows that he is the ruler of this cosmos or world that includes all that is in opposition to God, and he opposes God's rule and kingdom. The prince and power of the air could also be translated atmosphere, this picture Satan above everything, ruling it from the sky, both fallen men and fallen angels. The God of this age identifies a period in time in which he rejects the true God and substitutes himself and offers a counterfeit life and religion that dominates men. The Prince of Demons that describes him as Beelzebub or Lord of the Flies which is likely a term taken from the gods of the Philistines and is used as a Hebraic insult for their false gods. As a prince, he is also pictured as a ruler of the demonic host or army that brings men into spiritual bondage through idolatry and enticing their sinful natures. Lucifer, Isaiah 14:12. not all agree that this should be a title or a name given to him, but if so, it means shining ones and it depicts his original state among the other angels. Satan, which is used 52 times, simply means adversary, 
He is the self-proposed rival of God and the counterfeit substitute for the real. Devil, used 35 times, means slanderer. The devil is the one who slanders or the one who trips off believers and defames God. The old serpent identifies him as crafty and deception. He raises up false apostles, according to 2 Corinthians 11. And like he did to Eve, he leads men astray, according to 2 Corinthians 11.30. He is the great to picture him as terrifying and causing total devastation. He is the evil one, which clearly limits him to a specific name or person. Not just the personification of evil, but the evil one, which is also used in the Lord's Prayer. He's the destroyer, like locusts that destroy crops. He is able to destroy spiritual life. He is the tempter, since he tries and entices men. He is the tempter, since he tries men and entices them to partake of evil and engages them in moral combat. And he's the accuser, since he shows up in the presence of God to accuse us before the Father. And he is the deceiver, since he deceives the whole world on a continuous basis. There are many other titles and descriptions used for Satan, but these are some of the main ones. The identity and nature of Satan. He is, like all other angels, a created spirit. He has all the endowments of angelic abilities. This would include the manifestation of his presence in visible form. He was created by Jesus Christ, according to Colossians 1.16, since he is an invisible power from heaven. He is an angel and spoken of as the evil one. He is very powerful, but he is not ubiquitous, that is present many places at once. He may certainly give the deception through his army of demons, but ontologically he is limited. And in this world he is described as the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. And that judgment is upon this world because of that. And eventually this ruler, Satan, will be cast out. He is described as very beautiful. 2 Corinthians 11.14 He disguises himself as an angel of light. And some see him as the highest ranking angel that there ever has been. A cherub according to Ezekiel 28. And remember from our theology of angels that just because an angel turns bad and changes his will, it does not change his nature or his rank. He retains all that he is even if his will changes in opposition to God and becomes evil. And once the will is set, it is permanent and cannot change. So his will is always opposed to God, and all that his nature is, is directed against God in opposition to him. And he is totally morally evil, again in a permanent state of opposition towards God, since his nature cannot change. By describing him as totally evil, I do not mean to say that he is ontologically evil, since he was created good, but he is totally evil in the sense that all of his knowledge that is who he is, is used by his will against God and his program. But Satan is still a creature created by God and pales in comparison to God in every sense. God is infinite and Satan is finite. God is uncreated, Satan is created and has a beginning. God, of course, is all good and Satan is evil. Only God is all-knowing, and Satan is limited in his knowledge. Yet, of course, it can be greater than any one human or even the collection of humans. He is still limited in his understanding. God, of course, alone is present everywhere. But Satan can only have a local presence. He can only be here or there. He can't be in more than one place, exerting his will. God alone is all-powerful. But Satan, of course, is limited in power. He's limited to his angelic abilities, certainly greater than humans, and can be described as supernormal, but still nonetheless a creature and limited in power. And he cannot do what only God can do. Only God can create life, 
Satan cannot create life. Only God can truly raise the dead. Satan cannot raise the dead. And only God can truly supernaturally heal. Satan can only pretend to heal, or heal naturally, or heal perhaps according to his angelic powers. Satan can, of course, trick humans to think that he can do what God can do. He can trick us to make us think that he could create life, or raise the dead, or to heal, or to do signs and wonders. But all of this is a counterfeit and a trick, and nothing he can do is supernatural in the truest sense of what only God can do. The personality of Satan. Satan is described with personal pronouns. James 4.7 says, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Being described in personal pronouns shows that he is a person and not just the personification of evil. Satan has an intellect, and we can tell this because he tempts Jesus. He has the ability to create schemes and deceptions and to communicate those to others. All of this takes an intellect. And he has a will since he gives commands, such as Luke 4, 3, And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Giving a command is indicative of a will, and he leads a rebellion according to Revelation 20. When the thousand years are complete, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations. He is spoken of as having emotions. He has desires according to 1 Timothy 3, 6. Since the devil was conceited and fell and incurred a condemnation. He is spoken of as being jealous, since he was jealous of Job's blamelessness and uprightness and wanted to challenge it. He's full of hatred. He's an adversary that prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He is full of anger. In Revelation, he is picted as coming down, having great wrath, knowing that his time is short. He is held morally responsible. Only persons can be held morally responsible. Animals and things aren't held morally responsible, but persons are judged. For 2 Corinthians 11 says that his end shall be according to his deeds. And John 16.11 says that the ruler of this world has been judged. So clearly the Bible presents Satan as a person and with the characteristics of personality. Hence he is to be understood as as a real personal entity, and not just the personification of evil, but a person who is evil. The Depravity of Satan We begin by looking at a debate over Isaiah and Ezekiel between biblical theologians and systematic theologians. Biblical theologians, some of them, do not want to see Satan in these passages. And systematic theologians almost consistently use these passages to depict the fall of Satan. Reasons against using Isaiah, for example, as depicting Satan, they will point to the fact that the passage is of the king of Babylon. And it uses the language of Canaanite Ugaritic mythology that is applied to pagan kings. So some say this is not Satan, for Lucifer is called a man in verse 12. And he is compared to other kings of the earth in verse 18. They would say that his fall from heaven is a fall from a great political height. Systematic theologians, however, do see Satan behind the king of Babylon. They see a dual reference pattern that develops, especially between this verse and also Ezekiel, giving them justification for saying that Satan is behind this verse, as well as Ezekiel 28. There they will note that there are two persons, a human leader and Satan. There they see that there is a different nature of man that's in view. In verses 2 and 9, an angelic title, cherub, is used, described as perfect beauty in verse 12 and blameless in verse 15. In verses 12 and 13, it said he had a seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect beauty, which would not be things said of a mere man. So this debate that rages, which we will not solve here, does bring up the question, if the biblical theologians, for example, win this battle and show that these verses cannot be used, what is left for us to conclude about Satan? Well, there are many other verses that we can use to show the basic outline of what happened to Satan with regards to his original position and subsequent perversion. We certainly would lose a more detailed description and definitely a more eloquent description. 
but we would not lose the basic outline. So what I present here does not rely exclusively on Isaiah and Ezekiel, but will provide verses outside to lay out the basic outline of Satan's original position and subsequent perversion. He was created perfect by God, Colossians 1.16, where God, through Christ, created all things, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, which clearly includes the description of angels being created perfect, of which Satan was one. Ezekiel 28, of course, says he had a seal of perfection. He had a heavenly estate, Jude 6 says, and angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. And Ezekiel 28, of course, speaks of him being in the garden of God, which is paradise, and that he was an anointed cherub who was on the holy mountain of God. The time of his sin is clearly before Genesis 3, and likely before the creation of Adam and Eve. It is probably after the creation of the earth, mentioned in Genesis 1.10. Job 38.7 says, When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. And it could possibly be before the second day of creation. Some have pointed out that this is the only day of which it is not said it was good. The nature of his sin, of course, is pride. This we can tell from 1 Timothy 3.6, where it compares a new convert to the Christian faith who should not be given a place of leadership, lest he become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil, clearly indicating that selfishness or pride that might develop up in a new believer, disqualifying him for leadership, is the very sin that was incurred by the devil. And in 2 Thessalonians 2, 2-4, two where it speaks of the man of lawlessness, which we know Satan is behind, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displays himself as being God. This sin, which the Antichrist does, is copying the sin of Satan or the devil. And of course, if we turn to Isaiah 14, we can find clearly the five I will passages which conclude with, I will make myself like the Most High. The cause of his sin is personal free choice. God cannot cause anyone to sin. James 1.13 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. And as we've seen, Satan was perfectly created. He has a high angelic position, perhaps the highest, giving him the greatest intelligence, position, or rank, and he has direct access to God. There was no one else to tempt Satan. There was no previous example or pattern for him to follow. This makes his sin, his subsequent perversion, the most severe and consequential of all sin, since all these five conditions existed and surrounding his choice to sin against God. The result of his sin is punishment. He has expulsion from heaven. Revelation 12, 9, And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil, and Satan, who deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Even though this is mentioned in the end time, because time is not something that is relevant to the nature of ev eternal beings, this is certainly applicable to him as a description of his perversion and consequential punishment. The corruption of his character, 1 John 5.18, shows that he wants to touch those who are born of God, but God keeps them, and so the evil one cannot touch them. His perversion of power, Ephesians 2.2, describes the course of this world, which is according to Satan, here depicted as the prince of the power of the air, who works in the sons of disobedience. And he leads a defection of angels, according to Revelation 12.4. And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven, and threw them to the earth. And the final destruction of Revelation 20.10, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone. These are the clear results of his punishment for his sin and pride. There is an emphasis in scripture on the overriding providence of God. God creates only good creatures or things. First Timothy 4.4 4 says, 
for everything created by God is good. In Genesis 1.31, God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. God does not directly cause evil, but he does permit evil. And evil, you should remember, is a privation in essentially good creatures or things. And God is not the direct cause of evil. God is patient toward us, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And so God will produce a greater good out of the evil and privation introduced into his creation. And he does this in at least three ways. One, by defeating sin. He must not reign until he has put his enemies under his feet, and his last enemy being death, which was brought into creation by the sin of Adam and Eve through the temptation of the devil. And second, by destroying Satan, the Son of God appeared for this purpose, that he might destroy the works of the devil, 1 John 3.8. And third, by redeeming his servants, Romans 5.20, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And of course, God ultimately, as we'll see in eschatology, restores creation. What was lost in the paradise in Genesis is regained in the last three chapters of Revelation. The activity of Satan. Satan always works in opposition to God. He does it in two ways. One, directly. This is by his original sin, as we have seen, and also by his continuous slander. For it is Satan who can appear before the Lord and be our accuser and slander God because of our sinfulness. The second way that he opposes God is indirectly. And this he can do in many ways. One, by attacking God's word, which we see first in Genesis 3.1, where he says and questions, Indeed has God said. And then he attacks the image of God in man, starting in Genesis 3, by enticing the woman and Adam threw her to sin against God. Satan also induces Cain to murder Abel, which is an additional attack on man in opposition to God, introducing the first murder or physical attack on humans who bear the image of God. He also attacks God's Son, Christ. Matthew 4.1, he is tempted by the devil, and he attacks Christ through the world system, the rulers of this age that did not understand and therefore crucified the Lord of glory. I think it is important to keep in mind, in considering all these attacks that Satan makes, especially on believers today, that such attacks should be considered proportional to the faith that we have in God, or as Paul says, to the measure of one's faith. God, of course, is providential and sovereign over everything that all angels, including Satan, does, and ultimately uses it for his own purposes and glory. Job is attacked severely, perhaps the most severe of any servant of God, because of his high proportional level of faith and trust in God. And even in the New Testament, Jesus acknowledges when Satan asked permission to sift Peter, that before Satan could move even on a disciple of Jesus, permission had to be sought to do so. I think that we will find, practically speaking, that if we actively oppose Satan, By putting the gospel where it has been taken away by Satan and promoting truth where Satan has built a counterfeit, we will be attacked and challenged by him. It should be expected. And of course, the level of that attack will be proportional according to God's will, according to our level of faith. And finally, Satan attacks God's program in many ways. He attacks God's program in heaven, as we've seen by his original sin, but also on earth. And this is done in at least two ways. First, by taking away the truth. He prevents the acceptance of truth by snatching away the gospel and blinding the minds of men to the gospel truth. Luke 8, 12, then the devil comes and takes away the word from their heart so that they will not believe and be saved. In this, he promotes an attraction to his counterfeit by offering a lie. And this lie and counterfeit involves false philosophies and lifestyles, false religions and idolatry, false ministers, teachers, and doctrine, promotes schisms or divisions and introduces doubt, and provokes or tempts us to sin. And in principle, these areas identify apply to us on a personal level 
in our homes, in our churches, in our corporate or work environment, in government, with respect to nations, in politics, in every area of the world that is opposed to the program of God. The false philosophies and lifestyles. Paul makes mention of this in Colossians 2.8 when he says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy, an empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. We should not understand the term philosophy here to mean the modern discipline of study that we speak of today and take classes in today. Paul does not use that term in this way. Instead, Paul has in mind a philosophy that has infiltrated the church at Colossae. This is known as an incipient Gnosticism that involves not only doctrinal beliefs that are opposed to Christianity, such as asceticism and legalism and dualism, but also a lifestyle. He goes on to mention the worship of angels, which is likely being used as a means to promote themselves. This philosophy or lifestyle is based in pleasure in possessions, and in positions. It's an egocentric ambition, and if followed, it keeps us from desiring a relationship with the living God. Ephesians 2, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, and the mind and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Here Paul describes where believers were before they were saved, as being part of the world, who walked not by the Spirit, but by the lust of their flesh and mind. This is the lifestyle and the philosophy that Satan promotes in our world, in opposition to the program of God. Satan has produced many false religions, or idolatry, 1 Corinthians, Paul says, I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to gods. And I do not want you to become sharers in demons. It is clear from this that there are things in false religions that directly have the influence and participation of demons. In Galatians 1, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. But even though we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel, contrary to that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Here Paul specifically identifies a doctrine opposed to what he has preached that teaches salvation by human works to bypass the Savior's work on our behalf. We can see this in that all false religions teach a works-based system for achieving salvation, or they say that there is no need for salvation since we are progressing ourselves. All false religion produces an ethics that denies sin and evil, promotes relativism and occultic practices. Even within the church, Paul says in 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 3, but the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. And John warns us in 1 John that we are to test the spirits. In Satan's opposition to God's program, there are false ministers, false teachers, and false doctrine. 1 Timothy 4.1 But the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Here we are warned about deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons that can infiltrate even the church. They oppose true ministry and teaching and promote a legalistic and human-centered form of religion and produce many counterfeits of Christianity that we can see today in many new religious movements and the occultic practices. Second Peter 2.1, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. In the Old Testament, there were clearly false prophets that arose among the people. In Jesus' day, there were even false disciples in Matthew 13, 38 through 39. And Peter here says that there will be false teachers in the church. 
Paul, even in his day, identified false apostles and had to defend his true apostleship, even saying in 2 Thessalonians 2.2 that there were false apostles that were writing letters in his day. In 2 Corinthians 11.14, And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of unrighteousness, whose end shall be according to their deeds. So such false teachers come in deception to us. All of this, of course, is the work of Satan against the program of God. Satan promotes schisms and divisions and introduces doubt. 2 Corinthians 2.10 But whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I did it for your sake in the presence of Christ, in order that no advantage be taken of us by Satan. For we are not ignorant of his schemes. Here Paul encourages the church to take forgiveness very seriously. Christians in the church who fall into sin and who truly give and show repentance of their sin should be completely forgiven. Harboring unjustified anger and jealousy will give Satan an opportunity to introduce division within the context of God's people. And in taking forgiveness seriously, we also take holiness seriously, which is just as important. For as Paul says in Ephesians 4, we should be angry, and yet we should not sin. And when he says, do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil an opportunity, he is saying that we should always be angry at sin. And if we are angry at sin, then we are taking holiness seriously. And in Genesis 3, where it speaks of the serpent, was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. From the very beginning, Satan introduced doubt concerning God's goodness and God's word, making us question whether or not God truly does have concern for us, and causing us not to take the Bible or God's word seriously. And finally, Satan opposes God's program by provoking or tempting us to sin. In Acts 5.3, Satan filled the heart of Ananias to lie to the Holy Spirit, which is following the philosophy of achieving personal gain and hurting others in the process. Hence, Satan will tempt us regarding our pride, according to 1 Timothy 3.6, where pride here is especially associated with spiritual status in the church where it can create a danger of self-satisfaction and self-confidence, in which the believer would incur the condemnation that was upon the devil. He will tempt us with worry. Matthew 13, 22, And the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word, and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Worry about the world is not compatible with bearing the fruit of the Spirit. So Satan will use the world and its wealth to create worry in us. Hence, when we worry, we lose sight of who God is, His love and His care for us. And when we worry, we do not depend on Him as we should. He tempts us with self-reliance, as he did David. When he moved David to number Israel, relying on human resources and strength instead of God's strength. So when we are tempted to trust our human wisdom and strength, we develop confidence in human numbers and resources rather than putting our trust in God. He provokes us to be discouraged. First Peter says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Satan wants us to be occupied with our difficulties and problems. And Peter tells us here to be assured of God's care. But then following this, he tells us immediately to be aware of our adversary, the devil, because he prowls about seeking whom he may devour. A person who is overcome by worry of the world cannot follow God. This is even in the face of spiritual difficulties and even physical persecution. In all instances, we must trust in God and God alone. He tempts us with worldliness. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. 
Worldliness is all that is in the world that opposes God. This is from Satan, and he uses this to influence us by appealing to the lust of our flesh, the lust of our eyes, and the pride of life, or self-promotion. We must be intentional in putting others first before ourselves, especially in ministry. We must be intentional on how we can promote others and love others, to love them as much as we love ourselves, and of course doing this in a context in which we put God first and love Him with all of our heart, mind, and soul. And finally, he tempts us concerning sexual sin. Satan appeals to our sexual nature to have it satisfied by other means than what God intends it to be satisfied by, which is marriage. Stop depriving one another except by agreement for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and come together again, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Satan will tempt us with all kinds of sexual sins such as fornication, adultery, homosexuality, perverted self-gratification. All of these are explicitly or implicitly forbidden in Scripture. 